on the security front this year were international headlines pertaining to Pyongyang's persistent provocations as well as related repercussions and more. So what are pundits saying about North Korea's record-breaking year of blatant brinkmanship? What has been the impact of tensions on the peninsula on South Korea's arms exports? And what are the implications of North Korea's border and cyber violations? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. Today we delve into foreign media headlines on North Korea related matters this year. And for this purpose, I have Kwon Soa here in the studio. Soa, welcome back. Hello, Sunny. I also have Jaco Zvitslut with us. Jaco, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me here, Sunny. Right, so according to one international outlet, 2022 has been a record breaking year here on the Korean Peninsula amid. North Korea's blatant displays of defiance. Do you care to elaborate? Right. Uh, a number of foreign media uh, like the Foreign Policy and CNN have highlighted North Korea's record-breaking provocations this year in a yearly assessment, uh, calling it a year in brinkmanship and saying that Pyongyang is putting the world on edge. Uh, so record-breaking provocations in that North Korea fired an unprecedented number of projectiles in the span of a year. That's 67 ballistic missiles in 38 rounds and eight of them were intercontinental ballistic missiles and uh, if we combine cruise missiles uh, it's even more than 90 missiles in just a year so uh, to put that into perspective a little bit that's more than a quarter of North Korea's over 270 missile and nuclear tests um, uh, that were conducted this year. So uh, since 1984, they had conducted these uh, 270 missile and uh, nuclear tests and uh, a quarter of that this year and three quarters occurred during the Kim Jong-un regime. Uh, and some key events this year were in early November, uh, 23 or some reports say 25 missiles of different types were launched in a day. So with that breaking a single day record and also that was when for the first time a ballistic missile crossed the northern limit line, uh, one of the SRBMs or short-range ballistic missiles of the north flew just 26 kilometers south of the de facto maritime border uh, between the two Koreas. And then we also had the Hwasong-17 uh, launches, the north's most powerful uh, ICBM, referred to as the monster ICBM, uh, and that's theoretically said to be able to reach U.S. mainland. Uh, the Hwasong-12, uh, that traveled more than 4,500 kilometers and flew over Japan. Uh, so. So such a variety of uh, provocations came this year, but so what the North did not do was conduct a nuclear test. Although many say it's not a matter of uh, whether Pyongyang will push through with a new nuclear test, but it's rather just about when it's going to do that. Right. And Jaco, how have pundits on your podcast sought to perhaps explain North Korea's brinkmanship this year? Uh, well, yeah, brinkmanship and provocations are words that are often thrown around, but I have to say that provocations, of course, are a loaded term because uh, what may be a normal action for one country can be seen as a provocation by another country. Uh, but according to the, uh, the pundits who have been on the NK News podcast this year, there are three main reasons uh, why North Korea has been testing so many missiles. And the first one is simply for technical reasons. It wants to show and prove that the new missiles that it has developed are able to do exactly the job that they're supposed to do. And then the second reason is that it's uh, sending domestic messages to its own population that look we're a strong nation we can defend you we can stand up to the rest of the world uh, and that can help to build some pride uh, in the North Korean government's capabilities but it can also help to explain why economic sacrifices have to be made spending so much money on uh, seemingly uh, you know useless uh, uh, missile systems and then the third reason is it's sending external messages to the rest of the world saying North Korea cannot be ignored North Korea cannot be pushed around uh, and you know South Korea should not mess with uh, with Pyongyang um, so those are some three messages. Oh, and there's also sort of a side message to potential customers uh, we're making great missiles that you can buy from us Right, and staying with that, uh, so I believe this is something we covered. Aside from headlines covering North Korea, there's also been quite a bit of international coverage over Korea's standing now as a prolific arms exporting 
country. Tell us a bit more about that. We've covered this quite a bit. Right, Sunny. Now, while trade figures are not really what they used to be here in the South Korea, some sectors are emerging as new driving forces, and that could become key to Korea's export market in the future. And as we have been highlighting on Issues and Insiders uh, this year, some remarkable achievements have been made in the K arsenal sector. Now, this year's defense exports hit a record high of 17 billion U.S. dollars. That's more than double double the amount of last year. Uh, and a recent annual government report released this month cited data by the Stockholm International uh, Peace Research Institute, according to which South Korea was the eighth largest arms exporter in the 2017 to 2021 period, accounting for almost 3% of the world's defense shipments. Uh, and in the 2000 to 2020 period, South Korea was ranked as the seventh largest exporter. Uh, the Yoon suk yeol administration has been stepping up uh, efforts to turn the country's high-quality arms into a uh, future growth engine and then eventually become the world's top uh, four, number four in the defense export market. Uh, now, year 2022 will be remembered for a major contracts with countries like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Australia, and of course Poland, uh, because the mega deal with the latter one having contributed to uh, setting a milestone in this sector, in the defense export sector. So, in the wake of um, Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, Poland uh, purchased, uh, including K-2 battle tanks, K-9 self-propelled howitzers, and F-A-50 light attack aircraft. Uh, and the range of the deal is uh, estimated to total between 15 and 20 billion U.S. dollars. Right. And beyond weapons, uh, Jaco, also in foreign headlines was talk about Kim Jong-un's daughter, whose appearance also sparked speculation about a possible female leader in the future. What more can you tell us? People love to see a visual representation of power and all around the world there's a fascination with royal families in every country wherever they exist. Uh, now North Korea because of its uh, highly closed and secretive nature uh, it, it heightens that interest a little bit more. So indeed when Kim Jong-un brought his daughter to work to watch a missile launch back in November uh, it in, unleashed a lot of speculation and excitement and talk about uh, succession. All we can really say for sure uh, is that Kim Jong-un wants to be portrayed as a family man. And that's different from his father. Kim Jong-il didn't go around with his family. We didn't see his wife and children in public until uh, September of 2010 when there was that great coming out party for Kim Jong-un. And that was the first time that we knew Kim Jong-un's name uh, in North Korean state media. Now, in the case of the, the daughter of Kim Jong-un, uh, it has been reported that her name may be Kim ju e but that hasn't been used in North Korean state media. Her name has not been revealed in the state media. That's simply what the rest of the world is saying. So uh, the, it's interesting that we, we actually have very few details. They're using a term of something like noble daughter or a very revered uh, child. Uh, but other than that, uh, we don't know whether she's a chosen successor. She may be, but it's far too early to say anything uh, more than that Kim Jong-un wants to be seen as a family man at this time. Right. What we do know, however, so moving forward, of course, is that this year North Korea acknowledged the outbreak of COVID-19 within its territory. Right. So for a very long time, uh, around two and a half years, actually, North Korea claimed it was COVID free, uh, tightening its borders and implementing strict virus prevention measures. And uh, given it's already the most isolated country in the world, uh, it may have sounded plausible for a time being, but then it actually went from zero cases to more than a million. And uh, the country acknowledged an outbreak for the first time in the month of May this year. And this and prolonged uh, border closures as well as antivirus measures. And uh, with that, uh, even fewer transaction with the world, uh, fewer communication with the world, and that led to a worsening in shortages in food, medicines, and other necessity supply, and that according to human rights groups. Uh, in fact, satellite images by Human Rights Watch said North Korea's authorities imposed excessive and unnecessary border closures since January 2020, and that included up upgraded fences, guard posts, and patrol roads. And uh, despite becoming more isolated than ever, hardly any communication with the outside world, uh, it did not accept vaccines or uh, medical support that South Korea has been offering, for instance. But uh, the North did not spare money and research, uh, resources in 
continuing its development of its nuclear and missile program. Uh, now, speaking of the South, in August, Pyongyang declared uh, a victory over the virus and at the same time blamed neighboring South Korea for its first outbreak. Uh, how the situation looks at this point uh, and to which extent the virus has spread or has been contained uh, has not been confirmed. Right, unfortunately, of course. Jacko, North Korea also made headlines this uh, week after the intrusion of five North Korean drones into South Korean yeah. territory, South Korean airspace, that is. And it's said to be the first time since the year 2017. What look to be the broader implications of this blatant border breach, do you think? Well, I have to put it in, in some context. Uh, there is, since there is no recognized national border between the two Koreas, uh, because both sides claim jurisdiction over the whole Korean peninsula, uh, so technically what this is is uh, to do with the armistice agreement, right? There's no border, but since July 7, uh, 27, 1953, there has been a military armistice agreement designed to stop fighting and any kind of provocation uh, between the two sides. Uh, and I'm going to read one sentence here from Article 2, Paragraph 16 of the Armistice Agreement. It says, This agreement shall apply to all opposing air forces, which air forces shall respect the airspace over the demilitarized zone and over the area of Korea under the military control of the opposing side. So that means that no uh, aerial object, whether that be an airplane, a helicopter or a drone, can be flown over the border without the agreement, specific agreement, of both the commanders on north and south side. Now, since this clearly did not happen, what we have is a breach of the armistice agreement. Uh, and that w should be and probably is being investigated by the Military Armistice Commission and also by the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission made up of Switzerland and Sweden. Uh, unfortunately, North Korea does not recognize the authority of these two bodies and chooses when to engage with them. And so the effect will be minimal, uh, but they still have to be done anyway because to be uh, procedurally correct. Right. And staying with violations, so uh, another issue recently is about North Korean hackers targeting South Korean foreign policy experts. Could you tell us a bit more about this? Right. Uh, foreign media outlets and also uh, domestic outlets here have been citing South Korean authorities that claim North Korean hackers carried cyber attacks on at least 892 foreign policy experts here in South Korea uh, in a bid to steal personal data and also uh, to steal email lists as well. And uh, this incident was just reported a few days ago, but uh, the actual attacks were said to have uh, begun in April. Uh, the National Police Agency said the hackers also attacked online malls with ransomware. And among the think tank experts and professors that were targeted, 49 recipients of spear phishing emails uh, that claimed to have been sent by South Korean political figures, uh, these uh, 49 people actually ended up opening uh, the links uh, in the email and then visited fake websites and logged in. And this revealed their email accounts and data as well. Uh, Two companies paid 2.5 million won, around $1,200 ransom. Now, South Korean authorities have been saying that the attacks were meticulous, sophisticated, and uh, uh, surprisingly real. Uh, and this is expected to not be the last time that North Korea, uh, North Korean hackers use cyber attacks, which it has been using as a tool for revenue to develop their nuclear weapons. And North Korea even exploited the tragic Itaewon uh, crowd crush to target South Koreans with malware. Right. Hopefully better awareness about the situation will form some kind of prevention then. Mm -hmm. Jacko, some people say that North Korea's weapons development this year reached dangerous territory. That being said, what are your prospects for the year ahead? Well, they say that it takes two to tango. And in this case, uh, North Korea is really leading the dance because uh, South Korea is, is reacting to things that North Korea does. So what will happen next year will depend on some factors, most of those being factors in North Korea. So for example, the first one, will North Korea decide that it wants to uh, talk and engage with the United States and with South Korea? Clearly right now it does not. If it changes its mind and decides to do that next year, uh, then we might see fewer uh, tests and, and what we call provocations. Uh, but if it decides to continue on the path that it is right now, then we may see more test and in, in fact even uh, a nuclear test, the seventh nuclear test. Uh, another factor is will Kim Jong-un remain healthy? If he does, then we can expect stable leadership. And if something goes wrong uh, with his health, then uh, all bets are off, frankly. 
Uh, so in this sense, uh, North Korea is kind of leading that dance, and we see that a little bit in uh, President Yoon Song yeol here in South Korea taking a very hardline stance and saying that he will uh, send three drones for every one drone and, and uh, uh, you know, respond to every test with another test. Uh, and I, I hope that President Yoon is, is taking and listening to the best possible military advice uh, and, and not just acting on, uh, on impulse or emotion. I think that's uh, what we hope to see next year is a de-escalation. That would be nice to see. Right, hopefully. All right, Jacko, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts today. Thank and you for so having well. me, Sunny. As always, thank you very much for your insights. Anytime. Right, well, that ends this year's editions of Issues and Insiders. We return same time next Monday with the New Year's first episode. Do join us then. In the meantime, from all of us here at Arirang, Happy New Year.